Welcome to the Film Analysis, today with Blue Velvet by David Lynch. This classic was released in 1986. A classic, but not in the sense of a beautiful antique. There is still an irrepressible power emanating from Blue Velvet. A great film that is timeless and will remain timeless. David Lynch is considered a director not least because of his personal esoteric tendencies, confusing the audience, letting us slip into mystical worlds, creating chaos, and in it we are supposed to get lost. In his quasi-autobiography, Room to Dream, Lynch writes that the audience should experience the film and not think so much. His writing on Blue Velvet is relatively trivial. It's about craftsmanship, how one solved one thing or another. It's about gossip and a bit of genius cult, but nothing more. And otherwise, is the crate mysterious supposed to be in the foreground? Yes, this film, who wants to fathom it to uh, so thoroughly? What if the opposite is true? Blue Velvet is not convoluted at all. It's a very straightforward film noir with Sigmund Freud's theories serving as its foundation. Blue Velvet is not mysterious in a sense of we couldn't decode the film. We very much can. Rather, the mysterious is within us. The mystery we see is the mystery of our desire, our sexuality. And that's what David Lynch confronts us with. Let's get to the plot. The whole thing starts with a view of a small town, Lumberton, a hyper idyllic view. There is the fireman waving, the birds chirping, the little bees buzzing, and then there is a man in the garden. He suffers a vertebral body fracture while watering his plants, and his son Jeffrey, by now a student, comes back. He now must take over the role of the father at home. But does he manage to do so at all? He finds a severed ear. Uh, on the way back from the hospital where he visited his father. He wonders what to do with it and takes it to a detective. The detective starts the investigation, but he says he doesn't want to bother Jeffrey any longer and doesn't want to get him too involved. He takes care of everything. Jeffrey is rejected as an authority. He leaves the house and meets a woman. It's Sandy, the detective's daughter, a romance could unfold. But Jeffrey is not only attracted to Sandy, but also by the criminal case behind this severed ear. And he desires just not only Sandy, but something else, an adventure. He gets involved in the criminal milieu in the small town and we notice violence and power permeate every idyll. Even the one we saw so neatly cleaned up at the beginning. Every order is based on violence, even if we are often oblivious to it. A second woman appears, Dorothy. Her name is not coincidentally like the character from The Wizard of Oz because this Dorothy also opens a counterworld, but it's a counterworld in the shadows of Lumberton that opens. She is a nightclub singer and she is, as befits a film noir, the femme fatale. Sure, Jeffrey falls for Dorothy. He sneaks into her apartment, his private investigation begins, he hides in the closet but is caught there by her and he seduces him. But then he must hurry back, hiding in the closet another man shows up and this man is a very different man than Jeffrey is, who is somewhat awkwardly innocent. But is he so different? Hmm. Well, anyway, Frank Booth appears, played by Dennis Hopper, and we get to see a very peculiar rape scene. We see this pseudo-potent man yelling at Dorothy, demanding that she spread her legs. Then he beats her 
then he rapes her, he is beside himself, he's choleric, and at the same time he's also quite submissive again with all the dominance, and he identifies himself with a little child. Then he identifies himself again as the great ruler. What is this all about? Namely, about what Freud calls psychological impotence. In his essay on the general degradation of love life, Freud writes about the inability of some men to have sexual intercourse, although biologically everything works. But there is a psychological barrier preventing them from really desiring a woman from making love to her. Something deters them. These men, writes Freud, would have to overcome respect for women. What is meant by this? Not, of course, that men should treat women disrespectfully. No. Freud says many men identify women at the same time with their own mother or with their sister. And they can't bear the fact that, of course, their mother or sister are also sexual beings. And out of this strange ambivalence that they feel when they meet a woman, they precisely experience this psychological impotence. One bad way to overcome this circumstance lies in sizing the opportunity in humiliating the woman with whom you want to sleep. Or they would have to acknowledge what Freud says, all women are sexual beings, even your mother or even your sister. We have a very similar problem with Jeffrey. Freud describes this beautifully. Many men can't sleep as well with well-behaved women as with women of lower status because they recognize the mother, the sister, much more readily in these well-behaved women. And Sandy has something angelic, something decent. With Dorothy, it's easier, you might think, as she is a nightclub singer. She comes from a red light background anyway. But Jeffrey has learned before that Dorothy is also a mother. There's a reference to his own mother again. And we witness Frank humiliating her so that he is capable of overcoming his psychological impotence in any way at all. And we see it succeeding only rudimentarily. Jeffrey, meanwhile, is torn between two fantasies. On the one hand, there is the clearly recognizable fantasy Dorothy, also clearly recognizable through the wig she wears. And we also see her without the wig at times. But on the other hand, we should also understand Sandy as a male fantasy, because how does Sandy make her first appearance? Jeffrey is standing outside, it's completely dark, and Sandy emerges out of this darkness, out of nowhere, you could say out of Jeffrey's imagination itself. And there's a piece of music that reminds us a little bit of Vertigo by Hitchcock. This scene is a bit reminiscent of when Judy turned back into Madeleine and then she appears again completely manufactured as a fantasy of Scotty. And because of that, we could ask, isn't Sandy perhaps the much more mysterious one? We can read this film as a simple whodunit. A gangster must be hunted down, a woman freed so she can return to her kidnapped child. A simple young man outgrows himself. But what would be, uh, but, but that would be a bit trite. At the same time, we have another aspect here. We have a shift toward maturity here. Lynch uses this familiar narrative, that is, this crime narrative, but only on the symbolic level, to use it to show processes of sexuality and desire. We see what's going on in Jeffrey's psyche. He is searching for his true desire, resembling, say, Tom Cruise in Ice White Chat, only in a different way. He confronts the monstrosity of his own sexuality in the process. Frank will kiss Jeffrey. Like Frank, 
Jeffrey will beat Dorothy, like Frank, he fears and is attracted to Dorothy. Yes, you can say Jeffrey is also Frank when Dorothy spreads her legs for Frank, he whines like a little child and he pleads for his mummy. Only when he later humiliates Dorothy can he become active again. What does this side trigger in him? Let's think about what is hanging on the next, uh, on the wall next to Jeffrey's bed. It's a vagina dentata, a toothed vagina, a symbol of castration anxiety. And with that castration anxiety comes a fetishism. Let's talk about the fetish. Let's talk about the blue velvet. Lynch is again referring directly to Freud here and specifically to Freud's essay Fetishism. Freud says this fetishism is a phallus substitute. The child beholds in the mother's womb, the mother is supposedly missing something. Freud writes the following. To be clear, the fetish is the substitute for the phallus of the woman, of the mother, in which the infant believed and which we know why it does not want to do without. Consequently, the curse of events was that the boy refused to take note of the fact of his perception that the woman has no penis. No, this cannot be true, because if the woman is castrated, her own penis possession is threatened. And against this resists the piece of narcissism with which nature has precautionarily exposed this very organ." End of quote. Frank is just that child still. He investigates Dorothy's womb and he cannot see a phallus there. As the rape scene continues, Frank therefore puts a piece of velvet in Dorothy's mouth, as well as his own in the shape of a phallus. We see the same thing again later in the film, a piece of velvet hanging out of a man's mouth. So we still have a homoerotic relationship there because we can also find such a phallic symbol. This is the only way Frank can overcome his castration fear. That is the fear that he might soon be missing something down there too. And he can become sexually active, of course, at the expense of the woman. He rapes her. Jeffrey is confronted with his own castration fear by Frank's appearance. He has this very vagina dentata hanging on his bed for a reason. He is also then attracted to the blue velvet, that is, not only to Dorothy, but also to this velvet. A fetish is not to be found in Sandy. In addition, Jeffrey knows very well to interpret that ear, the severed thing that he finds there in a meadow. It is also a symbol of castration and he wonders what if that ear was my penis and why is it the ear of all things? Lynch says he wanted something that he could drive the camera into. But let's also remember that language speaking is the vehicle of desire. Psychoanalysis lets patients speak only in this way can they get to the bottom of their drives, their perversions, their fetishes. Language is quite crucial in articulating desire. It is the only form and such a vehicle of desire represents this language. We also see how it bursts out of Frank quite impulsively. Fuck, fucker, fuck. He is, so to speak, someone who is not at all in control of this unbridled sexual power within him. So it's an 
inner process we see again and again here in Blue Velvet, which is turned inside out, Jeffrey wakes up again and again from dreams. These dream fragments are exactly the things he has experienced before that we have seen before. That is neither in reality nor in dreams can Jeffrey escape his dreams. Blue Velvet is thus also a belated coming of age film. Jeffrey is already a student. He has majored in to a man, but he has a problem with his father. Not just with one, actually with three fathers. There is the biological father, he suffers this accident, the embarrassment that lies in this father figure is depicted nicely when the father suddenly lies weakened on the ground. He had a garden hose in his hand, but a, at crotch level, and you see how the father virtually urinates. This is an important passage in Freud's Traumdeutung. It's about a child being admonished by the father being scolded for having wet the bed again. And the child then dreams to free himself from the father's authority, so to speak, how the father stands in the room at night and suddenly must start urinating. The father's authority is weakened. Lynch captures that again here, but the father also loses his authority in another way. Namely, he no longer has a voice. He can't communicate with his son. And with that, the ruling order is also weakened, so to speak. The law of the father must also be pronounced. And that can no longer be sounded here. What is Jeffrey doing? He is not free now. He looks for a new father figure. The second father appears. It's Sandy's father, Detective Williams. This one is probably not the right father, but also just an ordinary man like Jeffrey's father, True. He imitates a bit of detective pose from film noir. We first see this lighting mood, this clear delineated shadow as we know it from film noir. But if we look closely, it's more of a cheap Humphrey Bogart. Moreover, this detective is, after all, Jeffrey's potential father-in-law. And that would start a very awkward relationship, the father-in-law and the sexuality of the daughter. Dynamic proves to be problematic. So Jeffrey must keep looking. And he finds a third father figure. It's a psychopathic gangster, it's Frank. But at the same time, he is also the imperious Übervater, the dominant father figure, ruling with an incredible, unpredictable cruelty that you can't just submit to. At times, all is well, but you never know what will come next. Frank embodies the violent side of desire at the same time. But Jeffrey here also sees in Frank his own perversions, his own fears, and he rejects those perversions by killing Frank. The patricide, you might say, frees Jeffrey up a bit, enabling him to move on to Sandy. Sandy is already waiting for him and thus Jeffrey also becomes part of the prevailing order. And we can ask ourselves, does Blue Velvet feature a happy ending at all? In his essay, The Uncanny Freud explores the question of how to define the uncanny. He talks about the German word unheimlich. That means something like mysterious, but it is part of the word family Heim that means home. So the uncanny is something that is nothing completely new or strange, but something familiar, even homely, that has been alienated. You recognize it, but at the same time you don't recognize it anymore. The uncanny was already there, it was present and then repressed and now returns the great theme of Blue Velvet. The film shows us the familiar, the homey small town idyll as the uncanny. It starts with the tulip bed, with uh, we see worms and vermin there. 
that too is nature which we like to suppress. We like to repress the biological side of nature just as we repress the biological in our bodies, especially when we desire sex sexually. The body is something quite repulsive. If you just think about how much bacteria we contain in our body, without bacteria this body could not exist at all. Further, we have the known turning uncanny also on the level of music. There is that tear jerker Blue Velvet, a song we first perceive as harmless, but here in this context it becomes the song of a fetishist. The song says, and I still can see Blue Velvet through my tears. The lover in the song has disappeared, the fetish object remains. In Roy Orbison's In Dreams too, we have not a harmless hit, but an obsession articulated through kitsch. Lynch renders the principle transparent. He illustrates how he works. Jeffrey first enters Dorothy's apartment when he appears as an exterminator to steal the spare key. We see Dorothy's apartment during the day. It's a little run down, quite the mundane place. Nothing is special about it, but when we return there at night, the lighting mood has changed. Nothing else, though. All the objects are still in the same place, but now all these objects have something abysmal. It's really a pleasure Grotto now, even though nothing has changed. Lynch is all about showing things in a different light. And that's what he is all about at the very end and when the Robin, a kitsch fantasy of Sandy's shows up. But this pretty Robin has an insect in its mouth. Yes, every idyll is barbaric, also applying to what we don't see anymore, the subsequent barbecue with Jeffrey's family and Sandy's family, like the in quotes, savages by the fire. Is this where the wife swap happens? Life, David Lynch wants to tell us, is obscene. And too often we only watch but do not see. It would be nice if you would like to support the film analysis financially. You can do so via my bank account or PayPal. Also, you can find me on Patreon. Thank you very much.